Good evening. Welcome to Donkey Talk. Today I have the pleasure of having State Representative Bob Kresik, House District 59, with us. Thank you, Bob, for coming. Well, thank you for having me. You bet. Now, I have a little history in here. Do you want to tell me about it? Yeah, I originally was uh, born in Dubuque and uh, lived there for a short period, and then uh, my folks moved to Waterloo, mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up in Waterloo. Did you? And, uh, and uh, went to Sacred Heart, Columbus, and then I transferred to West, and uh, graduated from there, and married to Liz, my wife. Mm -hmm. I got two daughters and four grandchildren, and uh, uh, so happy with all those things, and we're, Liz and I are gonna be 42 years coming up, so. Oh we've my. Been put, we've been together for a long time, so. She still hangs out with me and I hang out with her. Isn't yet. that nice? Yeah, it is. Yeah. You planning yeah. something big for her then? For 42? No. We had a nice event for our 40th. So. Did you? And uh, I worked at John Deere and uh, retired from there mm -hmm. and uh, chose to get into politics and ran for office and been doing it since uh, 2005. So. Well, the one thing I notice about you is you have a compassion for people. Yeah, uh, I do, uh, especially kids. That's one of my passions. I mm -hmm. think uh, I've been involved with the uh, uh, Allen Child Protection Center. Uh, and what they do is they'll, like if a child is physically or sexually abused, they do a forensic interview. Uh, and then they also do a physical exam of mm -hmm. that child and they can you know do that interview and that goes through the court system and it typically protects that child from one being abused any further and uh, also finding who the person is that did the abuse so that's, uh, awesome. that's a big area and I've been involved with other groups in the area trying to you know make sure it, I was a safe place for kids to grow up in that's awesome. Now I have a list here I want to read off. You are very involved. You're with the Viridian Credit Union Board, Planning yeah. and Zoning Commission in Cedar Falls. I was. You was? I, yeah. Okay. Cedar Valley's Promise Policy Board. What's that? Uh, Cedar Valley's Promise. You know, I'm not, I guess I don't remember that one. Okay. University of Northern Iowa's Metal Casting Center Board of Directors. Yeah, I uh, been on that for for a while, and it's actually part of what the tech works involved evolved into with the three D printers. Oh, neat! Uh, the 3D printers, uh, we were actually able to get some state funding and uh, put that together, and uh, now that's housed over at the tech works, and they're doing some really great things with the uh, foundry industry. That's fun. North Star Community Service Board of Directors, yep. uh, Senior Coordinating Living Unit in Des Moines, uh, UAW Local 838 Retirees Group. Yep. Awesome. Cedar Falls Lion Club. Yeah. Lions Club. That's a great, great club. They do a lot of really good things for the community. Mm -hmm. That's for kids too, isn't it? Yeah, we do a eye screening program. I think this year we've done almost 2,000 kids already. And we mm -hmm. find kids that are, you know, having some issues uh, with sight, and uh, we send that, we do an exam, and it goes down to Iowa City, and they look at it, and they say, well, this kid's all right, or there's some issues. And a lot of times, they can get in there and correct the, the issue for the child. So. Well, that's important in learning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's really neat. Cedar Valley Cyclists. Yeah, I'm a big bicyclist. Oh, that's ridden neat thousands of miles and in 2015 we rode from to the start of Ragbri, rode Ragbri and then took a day off and rode from Iowa City to Washington DC. Oh my. Yeah, so I love biking. Yeah. Uh, out in nature. Yeah. And the Nazarene Lutheran Church. Well, I was, yeah, I, I went to that church for quite a while so it's a nice place. Oh, yeah. all right. Well, we have all kinds of issues I want to touch base on because of the 2020 in January. So how about we start with mental health? 
Yeah, it's uh, mental health is, I've been involved with the Cedar Valley United Way here mm -hmm. for the last so four years. And the United Way took a, a, an interest in uh, trying to focus, put more focus on mental health. You know, right. currently in Iowa, the largest provider of mental health services is our correction system. Mm -hmm. And so th that's created a, a huge burden on our correction system. And then treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's two areas that we really need to focus is critical care access. And that today, the really only critical, there is some other, but by and large, it's the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has mental health issues, uh, the uh, law enforcement may get involved. Well, it, it, they're at the uh, uh, emergency room. So the critical care access is, is huge. And then early intervention. You know, exactly. We're seeing that with students in the schools that, uh, you know, may, uh, there's a documentary out that's called Resilience. Mm -hmm. And that really identifies the trauma that a child may be dealing in life, whether it's physical, sexual abuse, then maybe the mom and dad are having arguments. Mm. Uh, right. There, there's just all those things, and that trauma has a really negative impact. So we can identify that, and we can put solutions in there. We can prevent many of the mental health issues, and they're finding mental health causes other things, heart problems and mm -hmm. other conditions within the body. So the state, we passed some legislation last year that dealt with facilities, but we didn't put any funding in. And so without the funding, uh, you know, it's going to be rather difficult to establish those centers. So hopefully this year we'll take the effort and look at how we can get this critical care access mm -hmm. established around the state and then focus in the classroom on early intervention. How much do you think that diet affects the mental health? In my field, that's... Well, it's clearly, we've seen... Uh, like children that aren't getting fed, mm -hmm. it has a major impact on their abilities. Mm -hmm. It puts trauma into their life. Uh, you, I mean, the the food bank is uh, an example where mm -hmm. they they're over there right now trying to make sure that uh, backpacks are available to these kids with food in it. Oh. Yeah, and so. Poverty can cause trauma. There's a lot of issues oh, in it. Know. Early, you know, the child's developing. They're very young, so it's, it's so important. It's a it's a major problem. Well, what do you tell, talk to me about the medical cannabis? Yeah, well, we've been working on that medical cannabis for a few years. I think 2013 was mm -hmm. basically the first year that it came to the legislature, and there was a lot of skepticism. But what happened is there were mothers and fathers that came to the Capitol with their children that were, a lot of them were diagnosed with epilepsy. And the traditional medicine was not helping them. Right. And for a lot of them, they had heard about what was going in Colorado and how children were actually benefiting from it. And uh, so we put uh, through the Public Safety Committee, uh, we drafted some bills, and it, I tell you, it, it, it was not easy. But okay. we were kinda, we started at an infant stage with this cannabis program. We're still there too. I mean, mm -hmm. there are things that, uh, we actually had a bill that updated the program, made it better, provided additional conditions, mm -hmm. uh, took the, the dosage from a percentage to a gram, mm -hmm. Uh, allowed it, you know, these additional conditions to get access to it, mm -hmm. and Governor Reynolds vetoed it. And I'll just tell you, it passed, I think it was 97 to 3 in the House and 50, uh, 40 10 in the Senate. So it had broad bipartisan support oh, to get yeah. that done, and uh, it was vetoed by the governor. Now, there is an effort underway again this year to do some of the things that I suggested. Uh, it, it, 
you know, traditional medicines are not providing the care that people are asking for, especially chronic pain, epilepsy, PDST, uh, Crohn's disease. I mean, there's several conditions that would benefit from a, a good program. And the numbers of islands that supported it, it's about 80%. It's pretty significant. And no side effects. Well, very, very little. I you mean- Even the, heard of any? I, you know, there's, there's some groups that are saying that it creates a, an addiction. But here's the thing. We're talking about people that are struggling with their health. You know, they're not looking for it to, to get high. No. They're looking for a treatment that can help them. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, the addiction numbers, you know, right now in Iowa, people are, are, are getting access to marijuana and they're smoking it, even though it's illegal. Right. And Illinois just made it legal. I saw that. For recreational. Uh, we're, we're, I'm just really focused on, I, I talked to a pharmacist that went to the University of Iowa several years ago, and almost all of our medicines were plant-based at one time. And That's right. after the 70s, they did the war on drugs, and they came in and uh, uh, created these synthetics. Yeah. And you know, if you look at the ads today, the pharmaceuticals ads, they have all these conditions that side can, effects. The side effects, and so it's it's problematic, and uh, so I think this would be a good step forward. Uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to do something with this mm -hmm. to help people, and that's what we should focus on as a state. How can we help people that are struggling? I know with the, severe conditions. Well, with the pharmaceuticals, there's so many side effects that they have to take another drug. I was just talking to a friend of mine's dad. He's on like 13 medita medications a day. How can he mix that many medications yeah. and function? Well, uh, I've heard of the phrase over-medicated. Oh, yeah. And uh, so yep. it, it's, a, it's a big, big problem. Uh, we've probably got probably the weakest medical cannabis program in the country. Uh, if you look at other states, uh, where they're going with this and the benefits people are getting, mm -hmm. we, we, we should really move forward on this and uh, Make it provide happen. the help for people. Now, there's, there's two clinics here in town, right, already? Yeah. There's right. one out on LaPorte Road, and Cedar well, Falls just opened one. Uh, I'm not sure. On Main on Street. That. That's what I heard. No, I don't think so. No, they're called a dispensary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I'm not sure on the number, but there is one in Waterloo that I'm sure. Yeah. Cedar Falls, I don't think, but. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, I want to get to, we only have so much time, so I want to talk about the K through 12 and post secondary funding. Yeah, well, what we've seen over the last 10 years is. Uh, a dramatic decline in state funding for mm -hmm. uh, uh, K through 12. Right. And uh, that in particular is having an impact on our schools. And we're seeing classroom size increase. We're, uh, you know, we're seeing some of the rural schools that are, are struggling. We did, over the last few years, uh, give additional monies to schools for transportation costs. Uh, I think uh, Western Dubuque, mm -hmm. that's a school district in Iowa, they have to travel over 600 miles a day to, to get these kids in the bus. And so you can just about imagine the cost and oh, yeah. the expense that they're faced with, with trying, to, to trying to deal with that. So, uh, you know, the, and then we're seeing teacher salaries. Uh, you know, a, uh, a teacher will graduate, like say you and I, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the starting wage in Iowa is around thirty some thousand dollars. But you get out of college, and you've got this debt, tuition debt, okay. and you see some place like Texas or Minnesota or others that are paying fifty 
where are you going to go? And so right. I think we're going to be faced with a teacher shortage down the road on, on this issue, uh, particularly with the state funding. Uh, so the K-12, uh, and there's, there's a lot of other things. You know, we talked about the mental health issue. Uh, if, if schools had additional funding to deal with mental health, right. they could put more counselors uh, and provide that treatment. And then at the post-secondary level, you know, our community colleges and our, our region schools, we're seeing tuition uh, increases that are putting us in a bad spot across the country. Uh, I know students at UNI, <clears throat> we've been able to get additional funding, but if you look at, if you looked at it, in the seventh, well, even the 80s, State funding was here, mm -hmm. and tuition costs were here. Mm -hmm. Well, over time, it's changed no, no. where tuition costs are here, and state funding is here. So in Iowa right now, we're dealing with a skilled worker shortage. And guess who can help with that? Our community colleges, our colleges, our post-secondary, uh, to address a lot of those issues dealing with... Uh, uh, skilled worker shortage because the baby boomers are are retiring Well, okay, I don't want to switch gears here, but I want to cover a lot of things. What about restoring felon voting and criminal justice reform? Well, I guess that's another issue that uh, we dealt with last year and the uh, House passed a bill mm -hmm. that would you know if you're a felon and I think there's only three states in the country that ban felons from voting. Mm -hmm. You know, and that means that you served your time, and you've done your commitment, and you turn your life around. You know, you should be able to vote. Right. And so we did pass a bill that I thought was good bill, uh, and passed in a fairly broad a number. Right. And. It went over the Senate, and the Senate refused to uh, to take it up. And so, it we we need to uh, get that. Now that's still a live bill. Mm -hmm. The Senate would just need to address it. Uh, Brad Zahn, who I know well, he's a senator, uh, and he's chair of that committee. I really get a sense that he's interested in in getting it passed because. You know, I talked to a felon out door knocking that, you know, he's cleaned up his life, he's working. You know, he told me that I should be able to vote. And so he made a mistake early in life, and, mm -hmm. you know, now we're going to deny him that ability. And then, uh, you know, having some uh, criminal justice reform take place, uh, you know, currently our prison system is at a yeah, spot. That was my next question. Where oh, we've guess. grown significantly, and we're above capacity that our system has. Uh, we have a shortage of uh, prison staff, and uh, so there are things that 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 we could do. Here's one. You know, if if you didn't do a violent crime, you know. There's no need for you to be sitting in prison for 20 plus years. Right. I, I can see where, you know, if you create your crime, you go to jail. But 20 years, I mean, yeah. it, it just doesn't make sense, you know. And, oh, by the way, who pays for that prison system, the correction system? Mm -hmm. We do. Taxpayers. Right. Our dollars pay for that. And so, to me, it makes sense that we begin to address some of those juvenile, those criminal justice reforms that need to. Are you going to be addressing those in January then? Well, we'll always try and make it a, a topic that should be addressed, but it I, all depends. Yeah, the one area that I, I just wanted to touch on was the Medicaid privatization. I don't know if you were going to address that in our conversation. No, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> what, what we happened was in 2015, Governor Branstad selectively, on his own, without any legislative uh, interaction or anything, just went ahead and, and privatized Medicaid. And prior to that, it was state-run. 
And, uh, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, is doing a reasonable job, Maintain. you know. And so what we've seen happen is with this privatization, and I've heard from a lot of people on this, and uh, they're very frustrated. So like if you're a recipient of Medicaid services, I had one individual that was injured in a diving accident and he was a quadriplegic. Right. You know, he couldn't he couldn't do anything for himself. Well, with this privatization program, he actually had to go through the recertification process to uh, allow him to continue on Medicaid. And so what my suggestion would be, you know, about 20% of the people that collect Medicaid mm -hmm. in Iowa consume about 80% of the dollars. And those people are with, you know, significant down, like Down syndrome, right. you know, serious, like the gentleman that I described that had the diving accident. Mm -hmm. If we could pull those people out of that, put them back into the state run, and let's just say the 80% will let the privatization still flow. But uh, so, and then that, that's, the, that's actually the recipients. Now the, the providers of the Medicaid system, so many of them, I'm sure many folks have seen, they're denied payment and they're sitting there waiting for those dollars to come. I talked to one individual that owns a, a small facility in a, in a rural area and he had to borrow money to stay open and he was considering closing the shop. So it, it's creating a burden on hospitals in, in mm -hmm. areas, it's creating a, a burden on providers that uh, we need to address this. It, it's getting worse. And now we're down to two providers and uh, who, who, you know, if, you're, if you've had a doctor for years that through Medicaid that was providing services and all of a sudden you have to switch to another one. Well, that doctor can't go to that. You have to go to, it's, it's a it's huge. It's complicating. It's a huge Well, I've issue. heard that people have even died because they haven't received their medicines. Well, there, there have been a few cases of that. That's There's been terrible. stories on, on TV. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a big, big issue. Well, we have about five minutes left. I Real quick, I'd like to have you touch on child care. Yes. Well... <laughs> I can tell you that it sounds like child care, and that would be like for children, toddlers, and infants uh, to get care and access uh, while their parents are working. You know, in Iowa, about 80% of the parents in Iowa currently, they have, both of them are working. So if they have two children, uh, then, and the cost of that can be like eight hundred to thirteen hundred dollars per child. Oh, a I month. know it's outrageous. And so, what we're seeing is, especially with the worker shortage, mm -hmm. employers, some employers are starting to set up child care facilities for their employees, uh, so that they can keep them working. And what we need to do is work with the the cities, the counties, and the state. Yeah to come together and help, and employers, to come together to help establish some of these uh, uh, child care. You know, when I went to school, when I was a kid, my mom stayed home, my dad went to work. Well, that's completely different today. Yeah. It's not the it's same. Not feasible. Yeah. I, I know when I was raising my two, last two children by myself, uh, I would have to take them, I worked till 5.30, when, and they went to Price Labs, so I would have to get oh. off work, take them to the rec center until we got off. Otherwise, it was going to be like $300 a week for those two hours every night for them to yeah. go. I mean, just insane. Yeah. It was insane. So I know exactly what you're talking about. That's pretty serious as far as, especially with, what about minimum wage? How are we doing on wages? Well, they're, we're at seven and a quarter mm -hmm. in the state, which is dramatically low and uh, it's a problem. You know, we got people in our state that are working two jobs that are going to the food bank to get to pay, get food for their house. Oh, that's you crazy. Know, it's, uh, it's very problematic. 
uh, and I I don't get a sense that much is going to be done with that. You know, I, the Johnson County actually established legislation to raise the minimum wage. Johnson or Polk, I can't remember which one, but mm -hmm. uh, they ended up preventing them. They passed a law down there blocking them to do it. So oh, that's unbelievable. Well, we're coming to the end of the show. I sure appreciate you yeah. coming on board and sharing your journey and all your information. It'll be exciting to hear what happens in January. Yes, it will. I'll come back when we yeah, get Yeah, we'll have to do another show. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That sounds great. Well, thank you for watching the show. Have a good evening. Questioning our wants Spreading our